God has his word for us this morning and it's my privilege to bring it. So let's just pray. Father in heaven, uh, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the body of Christ that is assembled here. We thank you that when we gather, Lord, you are here in the midst of us. And Lord, that you will speak to us, each one of us. Father, we pray for open hearts, open minds, Lord, open souls, Lord, that you would lead us in your word this morning. And Father, that there would be transformation within each one of us. Bless our Egypt team, Lord, as they're traveling and... Lord, we pray that we could yet see them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I brought a message which began our Family Value series. And that message was called The Power of One. And it was focused on the last words that uh, that Jesus prayed uh, before his crucifixion. And in that prayer, he prayed that we would be one as he and the Father are one. And the reason for that is so that they may come to believe that I and the Father are one and that we love them. So those were the last words Jesus spoke before his crucifixion. Today, I'm going to bring a message that I'm calling There's Room for One More. And it's based on the last words that Jesus said before he ascended into heaven. So let's, I'm going to ask um, that we're going to read these words together. Jesus addressed these words to his disciples then, just before he ascended, and he still addresses them to us today. 2,000 some years later, he is speaking these words to us. And I imagine that if I was one of the disciples and I was watching Jesus standing beside me, and then I see Jesus literally lifting up, that the last words he would have said would be somewhat emblazoned in my heart and emblazoned on my mind. So can I ask that as a congregation, we actually read these words together. They're up on the first slide. It's from Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. We're going to read it aloud together. Go. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Three things we're going to look at. Go, make disciples of all nations. That first word, go. Do you know in the Greek, it's not actually a command like go. In the Greek, it's a present participle for anyone who remembers their grammar, which actually means as you go, on your way going. So really, we could actually translate that scripture, while you are going, make disciples of all nations. While you are going. It kind of encompasses everything that we do in life, all of our daily activities. No matter where we are or what we are doing, we are witnesses for Jesus Christ so that others can see him and that they can experience his love while we are going, while we are eating, while we are working, while we are shopping in the supermarket, while we are taking a morning walk, while we're resting. Go and make disciples. This really is the model that Jesus set with his disciples, isn't it? Because these guys, 12 disciples with Jesus, they did life together while they were going. They slept literally together, I'm sure. It was like probably in a big room somewhere. They slept, they ate, they talked, they discussed, they healed people, they performed miracles. They read the word and the scriptures and they talked about them together and they served the needs of other people with Jesus and one another. The disciples literally learnt as they were going. They learnt on the way. They learnt in the run of everyday life. Discipleship for the disciples was not a six-week course. Discipleship was not a book that you work through and it was not a video series. Discipleship was a relationship with Jesus Christ and one another, learning as they were going. Discipleship is actually a lifestyle that is lived out in community with other believers and and with those who are seeking to find him. Now, our Egypt did go, our Egypt team did go to Egypt, but 
I thought they'd be home right now, but they will be home very shortly. But the mission for that team does not stop when they left Egypt. The mission goes on for them in their everyday life where they can teach and they can love and they can serve and they can share their faith in Jesus with people in the Springfield community or wherever God places them. You see, as disciples of Jesus, we are Jesus to the people around us as we are going in our everyday life. Discipleship is a lifestyle. It's not an event. It's not a class and it is not a video series. Over many years of pastoring, John and I have heard this statement, I don't know how many times, we don't need to be in church to be a Christian. We can stay at home and we can watch Joyce Meyer and we can put on our worship music. We don't need to go to church, really earnestly, sincerely. But what does the word of God actually tell us? The word of God in Hebrews 10 verse 22 to 25 says this, Let us draw near to God. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds and let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. When left in isolation from other believers, you know what happens? We can make up our own doctrines, have our own little belief system going, which can be totally off base. When we live in isolation, we are open to the enemy's lies and there's no checks and balances, no one to say, hang on a minute, I don't think you're on track there. You see, Satan works hard to isolate believers through disappointment in God and through offense with other believers. You see, because if he can isolate us and keep us away from where we can be discipled and growing and transformed, if he can isolate us and keep us away from where we could be of influence and encouragement or we could spur someone else on, then he's won. He can't steal your salvation off you. Oh, but he wants to immobilize us. He wants to neutralize us because he who is in us is so great that he who is in us will change the world around us. And that's the actual heart of being a disciple and of making disciples. His end goal is to stop believers from being effective in bringing the kingdom of God here on earth. You know what happens when you pull a plant out of the ground and maybe you throw it in one of those special wheelie bins with the red lids now. There's wheelie bins you can put plant stuff in. If you rip a plant out of the ground and you shove it into the wheelie bin and you've taken it away from the shade of other plants that were around it and you've taken it away from the nutrient in the soil that it was in and you've taken it away from the light of the sun that was shining on it and if you take it away from the water, that would refresh it. What's going to happen to the plant and the willy bin with the red lid? Gone. Go means as we are going in our everyday lives, lived out in community with one another through the good and the bad and the ugly, we grow. We become disciples. And we disciple others. Today, we rarely even call ourselves disciples, don't we? It's sort of like a word we just don't even really use anymore. And yet the scriptures are full of it. Go and make disciples. You know, the term disciples was the most popular name for believers in the early church. Being a disciple meant much more than being a convert. Being a disciple meant much more than being a member of a church. The closest term we can find to that word disciple is apprentice. An apprentice. You see, what happened was a disciple attached himself to a teacher or a rabbi. That was the Jewish word for teacher. A disciple would attach himself to a teacher. He would identify himself with that teacher and he would learn from that teacher 
He would actually live in very close proximity to this teacher, follow this teacher around, whatever the teacher did, the apprentice would do. Hands up, have we got any apprentices? Or if you've done an apprenticeship at some stage in your life, we've got a few different apprentices or maybe now you look after apprentices and they're following you and learning from you. Jesus called his disciples and he taught them as they were about the flow of everyday life. We tend to use another word. We tend to use the word mentor for someone who might encourage us in our faith. However, these relationships can be really casual and infrequent and don't quite match up with that word disciple or discipler. The word disciple or this word apprentice has a much more dynamic, life-filled meaning for us. The 12 disciples who spent time with Jesus, they underwent radical change, (laughs) radical transformation in their lives. You see, you can't hang around Jesus and stay the same. Fishermen became fishers of men and dynamic speakers workers of miracles, dishonest tax collectors became repentant and paid back everything that they owed. Mary, who was a woman who was demonized, was set free and she became one of Jesus' disciples. There were women disciples that also traveled with Jesus. Wishy-washy, blow like a reed in the wind, um, Simon becomes Peter, who is the rock that Jesus could build his church on. To spend time with Jesus, to be discipled, meant radical transformation. Discipleship is radical, dynamic, and it will set off a process of growth and change in a believer's life. And someone who came to my mind, and she's not here right now, and that's Steph Williams. Steph Williams just last year, I think around April or May, came to the Lord and gave her heart to the Lord. She's just done a mission trip. I would say that's pretty radical discipleship. A lot of change and a lot of growth, actually, in a fairly short time. Do the people who hang around us change? Tess challenged us last week. She said, you become the average, we become the average of the top five people we hang around. And by top five, we simply mean the ones we spend most time with. We become the average of those five people Would we consider one of the five people that we would spend most time with to be someone who is discipling us? Would one of the five people we spend the most time with be someone who we are discipling? A disciple. Who is he or she? A disciple is someone who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he lived on this earth and he died on the cross and that he was resurrected from the dead, and that he saves us from our sins. A disciple expresses this faith openly, publicly, by being baptized. And a disciple remains in community with other believers where they keep learning and they keep growing. And then a disciple will ultimately go out and introduce other people to Jesus, and ultimately to teach other people the way of truth and life. Some churches now pay pastors to go out and win the lost and to disciple new believers. Some churches pay pastors to do all these jobs, but the people themselves are either remain as spectators or maybe cheerleaders. Go, Pastor John, that's fantastic. This was not Jesus' intention when he gave the Great Commission. If you look at that word, co-mission. Co meaning come together. We come together on mission. Mission is not something we can achieve all by ourselves. We come together in Jesus' mission, which was to bring all the sons and daughters of God back into the family of God, back into relationship with his family, and to then help them grow up in their most holy faith and ultimately to grow into the fullness of the image of Christ. That's the ultimate gain of our goal of our discipleship. Our whole lives are actually one long extended mission trip. It's the responsibility of every believer here to make disciples as we go about our everyday lives, not just the responsibility of a few. 
It's not enough just to introduce someone to Jesus. Yay, they got saved. How wonderful. The responsibility extends for us to disciple that person so that we can help them grow and mature in their faith, not just celebrate that they said the sinner's prayer. At our last United service, I, my heart was so warmed and gladdened. We had, John gave opportunity for those who wanted to commit their lives to the Lord. And people came forward and then he said, if you intend to be one of the ones who will stand with that person and dis- be a part of their discipleship, then come and stand with them. And then immediately, people had two or three people that were standing with them and immediately praying with them. I believe that that's the picture that God has for us, the church, that there would not be orphan Christians, that each person who comes to faith in Christ would have mums and dads and brothers and sisters in the faith who would be actively engaged in leading them and discipling them and encourage them as we are going about our daily lives. Here's some questions for us. And I just ask we close our eyes while we meditate on these questions. And maybe you don't have answers for all of them, and that's okay because it's not a get all the answers right deal. It's just to meditate, and maybe there's some adjustments we want to make. Who is intentionally encouraging us forward in our Christian lives? Can you name any of them? Who are we following and looking to for wisdom? Who are we intentionally embracing in our lives so that they can learn to follow Jesus by watching and doing life with us? Who do we sit and open up God's word with regularly? Who do we pray with? And go about life with. Who do we call when we, de- when we need prayer? I pray that some names came quickly. But if names didn't come quickly, then the rest of this message is going to encourage us to seek out names. Just imagine if every believer, you may open your eyes now, if every believer just discipled one person, For three years. It took Jesus three years to work through 12 disciples. Imagine if just all of us had one person that we just took alongside as we're going and we intentionally discipled them for at least three years. Do you know the church would just explode? (laughs) If every three years you doubled in numbers and not just a new believer who said the sinner's prayer but um, someone who becomes mature in their faith and can start to stand strong and starts to live in freedom. Sometimes I think we do stuff on mass so much, you know, we're looking for something big and we neglect the, the one as we're going. I want to challenge us for the one as we're going. Joy Greats has discipled me for, I think it must be 15 years now, And she invited me on my very first mission trip to Ukraine. And I'll be traveling with her. She's actually a keynote speaker at this Istanbul conference. So I'll be traveling with her then. I'm still being discipled by joy. And if I've got something heavy going on, bing, can we do coffee? And she will challenge me. You don't get away from a conversation with joy without having to do some serious readjustments. She challenges me, but it's good. You know, I don't feel put down. I feel there's a way opened up in front of me. We shouldn't be surprised if we start to follow in the footsteps of the one who's leading us. (laughs) If we start to do some of the same things that they do and get involved in what they do, because as they disciple us and they're bringing us along as they're going along, (laughs) we'll find ourselves doing the things that they are doing. Jesus did this. And then he went one step further and he said to his disciples, you'll do even greater things, even greater things than I have done. Look for someone who's ahead of us on the journey, on their Christian journey, and we can ask to spend time with them. 
Or if we see someone and we can see they need encouragement, they need picking up, you know, they need help, then we can offer ourselves. It goes two ways. You can ask for it, you can offer it, but if we're at least intentional, some of those relationships are going to be happening. You just invite them along to what you're already doing. Because I think sometimes we think, oh, I've heard a lot, I don't have time. I don't have time to mentor people. I don't have time to disciple people. And I think that's because in our mind we think it's this course. You know, it's, it's going to be this series and it's going to take so much of our time. You know what discipleship can look like? I'm, I'm taking a drive down the coast because I've just got an appointment down there. Do you want to come in the car? So how's your life going? Da, 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 da. And that person just comes with you. Or, you know, you've got a shopping outing and you just invite that person to just, as you're going, just be a part of your life and the conversations that you have will be rich because the Holy Spirit will be there. And in those more casual settings, sometimes more things will come out. And then you can offer, well, okay, we're going to pray seriously through X, Y, and Z. Let's make a specific time where we're going to pray. And it might just look like online sharing your quiet times. And I know some of you guys are, are kicking in with that. Hey, I was reading the word today. This is what I saw. What did you think? What did you get? Bantering backwards and forwards. I think we've made it into some animal that it is not. As you're going. Because there's always room for one more. There's generally room in the car for one more. There's generally room at the dining table for one more. There's room in our lives for one. One who can come along as we're going and we rub off on one another as iron sharpens iron. SCF is a church. So we've talked about going. We've talked about what making disciples looks like. And I want to talk about all nations. And SCF is a church that is serious. And I might, you might say, you're preaching to the choir here, Deb. You're preaching to the converted here. We're serious about making disciples of all nations and we're involved with many other people from many other cultures and from going to many other nations. But if we see all of our lives as the great co-mission, then it's good to ask ourselves, how open are we here at home in Australia? How open are we to people from all nations here? You see, it's really easier to reach out to people who are familiar to us, to people who we are comfortable. But it's more of a stretch to reach out to people who come from a different background, maybe have a different language. We've got more challenge in communicating. Jesus often referred to the kingdom of heaven as a great banquet where there was lots of room for lots more. And in biblical times, to receive an invitation to a feast was a great honor. And not everybody got invited to these kind of feasts because they reflected a person's social status. So many people of a certain strata in society would get invited to these banquets. They were an opportunity to kind of jock, jockey for um, position. You know, and actually where you even sat at the table, you know, the person who sat the closest to the host of the banquet, well... That was the prime position. That's where you wanted to be seen. You wanted to be seen with the right people. And in Jesus' time, it was actually against Jewish law to invite people who um, were damaged. It was actually against Jewish law to have someone who was a sinner, who was a social outcast, who was poor or who was handicapped. Or, oh, goodness, if they had leprosy. No. You wouldn't have a leper come to your dinner table. That was the Jewish law. In first century Jewish world, there were very strict religious rules about who you could and couldn't eat with. You could only eat with people that you shared intimate relationship with. Only those people who shared the same values and the same beliefs that you had. Only those people you counted to be family or who belonged to the same community. Not Samaritans, not Samaritan dogs. No, you would not have them at your dinner table. To eat with someone meant that you accepted them socially and the dining table was a very exclusive table. While at a very exclusive banquet, 
that Jesus was invited to. And he was actually sat next to the host who was a prominent Pharisee. In this environment, Jesus says these words. When you give a luncheon, they'll be on the screen. When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbours. If you do, they may invite you back and you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is from Luke 14. And then, to just kick it in a little bit harder, Jesus tells a story. And it's the story of a banquet. He's in a very exclusive party with a very prominent Pharisee with no riffraff invited. And into this environment, he tells the story of the banquet. In the interest of time, I'm not going to read the parable, but I will paraphrase and refer to it. Jesus is a Jewish rabbi, and he is well acquainted with Jewish rules, particularly about eating. Now, lesser rabbis probably would have given their eye teeth to be invited to this particular banquet with this particular prominent Pharisee. Jesus, however, is being carefully watched. Oh, my goodness. People are hanging on every word. If anything, I would say his invitation to this banquet was a trap. The Pharisees were looking for things to pin on Jesus. So they were listening to every word. The positioning where you sat was an indication of your social status. And here's Jesus sitting right next to the host. Sinners, outcasts, the disabled, the poor, everybody else was outside. Now, in those days, there was no television. There was no My Kitchen Rules or MasterChef. Hard to believe, isn't it? So much of it in our world now. However, you were allowed to look in the windows of famous houses. So if you were one of the poor or the outcast or you had leprosy or something else, you could stand on the outside and look in through a box and watch the dinner on the inside. Reality TV is not a new phenomenon, is it? (laughs) Well, unlike the exclusive dinner parties of his religious peers, Jesus' parties were inclusive. Instead of looking for ways to keep people out, (laughs) Jesus was always looking for ways to bring people in, to welcome them. You see, God's character, his very nature is to be inclusive of all people. He wants all of his children home, no matter how far that they have roamed, no matter which nationality, tribe or tongue that they come from. He wants all of his children home. Repeatedly through the Bible, we hear God's heart calling children from the north, the south, the east, the west back to him. And no matter how many times God's people Israel, don't you find when you read, um, and we're just in Exodus again, oh, the jolly Israelites, here they go again, off the wagon again making mistakes again. Could they not get it right? Don't they remember the miracles that Jesus worked to get them out of Egypt? Can't they get their act together? I know that's sometimes how you feel, isn't it, when you read those stories. But it's evidence. God takes them back. He takes them back. He pours grace again. He makes a way for his children to come home. If you've been resisting God's invitation to come home to him, then even today is another opportunity. And he's saying, come home. Come home, my sons. Come home, my daughters. Jesus' table is inclusive. And if your heart is thumping a little bit harder right at the moment, then you know that that's perhaps you. And we would love to pray with you at the end of this service. In the parable of the banquet, there are three rounds of invitations that go out. The first round... And the whole banquet is really a picture, isn't it? It's a picture of the kingdom of God. And it's saying that we are all invited to the great wedding feast of Jesus and his bride, the church. And those who have accepted are sons and daughters of the living God. 
And they now then get to go and extend the invitation to others. The round one invitations went to families and friends. The very first people who received the invitation from the master of the banquet were those who lived the nearest. Well, if you imagine the master of the banquet, he lives in a very fine place. He's the king. Well, closest to the castle, you've got your rich people, your people who are doing well in life. They're the first ones who get the invitation, the people who know him. And yet it tells us in this parable that they are too busy. They're too distracted to come to the banquet. You see, they've filled up their lives with the many blessings that have come by living near the king, living in close proximity. The first round of invitations represent those who have grown up with the knowledge of God, seen the things of God, heard the things of God. They've grown up with an invitation from birth. And in this parable to these Pharisees, the people at this dinner, these were people who grew up with an invitation because they were Jewish. They'd grown up in the family of God, the people of God, the Jewish nation. They'd been privileged to grow up and be taught and to learn in the synagogues. Still today, there are those who have grown up around the things of God close proximity to the things of God, maybe grew up in a Christian family, maybe had the privilege of hearing the gospel over and over again in a church on Sunday and still can say, too busy, other things to do, other priorities. And they've not accepted the invitation. They're close to it, but they haven't accepted it. The invitation still stands. How long do we wait? The second round of invitations. When those who'd received the first round of invitations refused to come to the banquet, the master of the banquet sent his servants out further, out into the streets and out into the alleys, and they were told to invite people that were unknown. This second round of invitations represents those who live by, they're just unknown. See, there are many people who are close to our lives, near where we live. They might be people at work, people at our schools, people down our street, but they're kind of people we overlook. They're unfamiliar to us. We don't have a close relationship to them. It's easy to invite those who we know, the close friends, the close family. But God is drawing our attention to further afield. These second round of invitations were especially directed to the poor, to the blind, and to the lame, to those who had previously, according to Jewish law, been excluded from invitations to the banquet. Talk about radical. Inviting a leper to the king's feast. Inviting someone without a job and no visible means of support to the king's feast. They're the ones that the second round of invitations, those normally overlooked, the outcasts, those of no reputation and no influence, they're also, in Jesus' day, these very people were not only excluded from feasts, they were excluded from temple worship. You were not allowed to go to the temple and worship God if you had defects or something wrong with you. There would be no exclusion for anyone for any reason from this banquet, however. They were invited and they came. You see, Jesus was removing the dividing barrier that stopped people from coming to him because he was the master of inclusion. And he lived this out as he discipled his disciples, as he was going on with his everyday life. He went to Zacchaeus' house, a thieving tax collector with a bad reputation, The rule was you don't eat with anyone like that. Jesus says, I'm coming to your house for dinner. And he goes there, a known sinner. Then he goes to Matthew's house. Matthew's also a tax collector and he is a liar and he is a cheat. And God goes to, uh, Jesus goes to his house and Matthew invites all of his friends and many of them repent and are saved. Jesus also welcomed a prostitute who came and washed his feet with and dried his feet with her hair. He helped a woman who was caught in adultery and saved her from being stoned. Peter was given a vision of animals coming on a sheet out of the sky and they were all the sort of animals that in Jewish law, it was against the law to eat. And God says to him, get up Peter and eat. 
God was showing him that the table was to be inclusive, that the family of God was to be inclusive. It was not to be limited. There's no people group, there is no sin that the blood of Jesus does not cover. There is always room for more. There is always room for more people in God's kingdom. Our job is not done. The time is not over. We have opportunity. Third round of invitations. Even when all the towns blind and crippled and lame came to the banquet, there was still room. So the master of the banquet sends the servants out on another round of invitations, this time even further out of the city, way out into the country lanes and the roads. And these people are much further afield. So the servants have to go via other pathways, not the main roads, these country lanes. They have to go to places that are unfamiliar completely and to speak with total strangers and invite them to this feast, people they would normally never speak to. These are the people that we don't know. These are the people who aren't in our usual routine. These are the people we don't normally have influence over. There may be places and there may be people who are outside of our comfort zones. Isn't that true? You know the feeling. Feel a little bit of cringe factor. Feeling a little bit uncomfortable right now. Don't know what to say. Those moments. These may be people from another culture. They may be from another socioeconomic group. They may be from another nation. They may be from another part of our world. These are people that we have to intentionally seek out in order to extend the invitation for the kingdom to come. These are people we don't know. This is the teacher in the classroom that you're teaching RI to. (laughs) These are people you might meet on a mission trip. These are people you're walking, you're prayer walking your streets and you meet a complete stranger who just tells you his life story. And there in the street you say, can I pray for you? A little bit of a cringe factor, just a little bit uncomfortable, but you press through because you can tell that an opportunity has just opened up where someone has shared their trauma, where someone has opened up their heart and if Jesus doesn't enter in in that moment. Something else will. (laughs) We've got to make sure Jesus is in and the door is closed through prayer. Perhaps it's being a pen pal to someone in prison who you've never even met. You're just going to start encouraging someone. Next month on the 28th of March, we have the opportunity to do the garage giveaway at the community center and to show people God's love in practical ways. And the vision is the week before Easter to give a living 3D picture of the love of God under the banner, God so loved the world that he gave. We just want to give this picture of Jesus in the week before Easter and then we give invitations for those people to come to a um, service over Easter time. And we're looking for volunteers. There's all sorts of tasks that will actually make that happen. But we'll also be looking for volunteers who will just be there to interact with the people, just to carry their boxes to the car, just to ask, how are you and how's your family? Just to say, is there anything that we could help you with? There'll be people there just to do that. So that, and it might feel a bit uncomfortable. There might just be a little cringe factor because you don't know the person and they might be someone from another country and they may not speak your language even. I guess that's the beauty and those who've gone on mission and you're just thrown in the deep end, aren't you? You're just dumped in another country where they speak another language. So you just learn how to do sign language and use your face and you pray in tongues a lot because you don't know what else to do. It's a good thing about going on mission because it just trains us. It trains us to get out of our uncomfortable zone and to, to reach out to people who may be not our kind of people, different kind of people, but what a blessing. What riches come when we find brothers and sisters in God's family and there's, suddenly there's a connection because we've pressed past the uncomfortable stage. I might just ask the worship team to come up, please. How are we going for time? Oh, it's up there. Okay. (laughs) 
There's a text message. Oh, okay. All right. We've got out of customs late, so the team won't make it. However, we're on our way for coffee afterwards. So, you know, you're just going to throw a bit of love on that team. They're going to be so exhausted. And can you just encourage them? Because they've just been out of their comfort zone. (laughs) They've just been pressing in with disabled children, with babies who only get their nappies changed once a day. They have been with little old geriatric people who can't speak their language, who could only speak Arabic. And all they could actually do was hold that little old person's hand and pretend they understood. Because it was more important to connect on that moment than to go, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're saying. We can fake it, can't we? I've done that lots of times. Someone speaking Russian. Off they're going. Yes, yes. Can I pray? And I just pray in tongues. Holy Spirit washes over that person. They start weeping and then they tell the interpreter, I had no idea. How did you know what was happening in my life? You want to live on the edge. You want to get excited about your Christian faith. You want to get hungry for the word of God. You want to get filled with the Holy Spirit. Then put yourself in the uncomfortable places. The third round of invitation. First round is the people who are close. Second round, the people who are a little bit further on. Maybe still from your nationality, but you just don't know them. But the third round is way in the deep end. These are people you don't know, you've never seen, you can't speak their language. They dress differently, they eat differently, they do everything differently. And you know what? They may even worship another god. But you have a moment where you come and you can be Jesus in that place. The book of Revelation tells us there will be every tribe. There will be every nation. There will be every tongue. There will be every people in heaven. This is the practice ground. This is the place where we can get used to that. Romans 10, 13 tells us that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We had an amazing testimony from Francis Coops at our ladies' breakfast. A moment on a drug overdose of heroin, on a mattress in a dark little drug house in the back of Cooperu, has no knowledge of God, but in that moment, the person says, I don't know. I don't know you, God, but I want to know you. <sighs> Open vision. Angels with swords fighting a demonic presence for an entire night until the day breaks and the dawn comes, the vision closes and she's still alive. I don't know you, but I want to. How beautiful is our saviour? Not based on what we do and what we get right, but based on who he is and his tremendous love for every single one of his children. Jesus' last words before he ascended into heaven. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem, to those disciples, was their hometown. Judea was the next place out. And Samaria, well, those were the Samaritan dogs. Those were the people we totally don't want to have anything to do. And then to the ends of the earth. Talk about round of invitation after round of invitation. You see, he will not stop. He will not stop giving the invitation. He is calling his children home. And he's asking us as his disciples that we extend the invitation that we're prepared to go not just to the ones near and dear, but that we're prepared to go to the ends of the earth. I believe this is a church that is prepared to do that. Many people here have done it time and time and after again, and many people here have supported financially and enabled others to go, and God is calling us for more, for more, for more. He is not finished. He's calling us to live inclusive lives because there is always room for one more he's calling us to be disciples 
and he's calling us to disciple other younger believers as we go about our daily lives. Our everyday lives, we just have to include one person. Come along. Come be with me. Tell me your story. How's your relationship with God at the moment? Is there a struggle in your life? Let's open the word of God together. Let's seek him together. Let's pray. You can do this. He is strong. He will be your strength when you're weak. That's what discipleship looks like. Can we make disciples? Put your hand up if you think you could make a disciple. Could you do that? Could you bring someone along in your life? I believe you can do that. I believe we're called to do that. And how special do we feel when someone invites us? Deb, come with me to Ukraine. Deb, please come and have a coffee with me. Just feel like God's got a word for you and I want to encourage you. I still need to be discipled.